new proclamations. What wise men, great men, medical men, professional people have not been able to do, God will do it. All those things that are forgotten, your forgotten strength, your forgotten power, your forgotten revelation, everything you said, I had a dream long ago. And I thought, this is what I will do. I've forgotten now, your forgotten vision will come up again. Passion will come up again. Revelation will come up again. New life will come up again in your life in Jesus' name. Only Christ Jesus has the power of this new year. An unforgettable encounter beckons. We are connecting to the God of wonders this new year for salvation and deliverance. Welcome GCK to Asaba. Delta State, Nigeria, January 26th to 31st, 2023. 1600 hours GMT daily and Global Sunday Worship at or 700 hours GMT. Also featuring ministers and professionals conference with Impact Academy for Youth, Young Adults and Young Professionals. It's a new year of wonders this 2023. From the Niger Delta, the oil of anointing will be transported by satellite and all our social media links to over 150 countries of the world. Join the team in GCK audience as the man appointed by God, the convener of GCK, Pastor Dr. W.F. Komoi, connects the world to an unforgettable encounter with the God of Wonders. Glorious music ministrations by choirs from nations across the world with guest music ministration by Jonathan Lee. Darkness gone. Yeah. Premature death cancelled. Yeah. Yours is now to reap the benefit. GCK, the, the gospel, gospel to every creature. Let us pray. Our God in heaven, we thank you for bringing us to this study, this time. We're asking, O oh Lord, that as we look at the scriptures together, that you will reveal yourself and reveal your truth to every one of our hearts in Jesus' name. We pray, O oh Lord, that you will so help us that our lifestyle will match our declaration of faith, will match our testimony, so that internally and outwardly too, we'll be able to live in such a way that the people that see us and read the Bible will know that there's a similarity between what they see in us and what they read in the world. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. Today we're going to study from Colossians chapter 3, and we have now come to verses 8, 9, 10, and 11. 8 through to 11. Colossians chapter 3. From verse 8. But now ye also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. In a passage that we're studying today, you will see some words that are strategically placed or written. In verse 8, but now ye also put off, put off. Then in verse 9, it says, ye have put off. You see those words, put off in verse 8, put off in verse 9. Now in verse 10, and have put on, putting off, putting on, very close and very similar to what we do when we dress. Before we really get dressed for a special occasion, what we do is that we put up the clothes we, we have been wearing, and then we put on some clothes that we now want to wear. 
And actually, you know that in a professional life, dress often matches the profession. What I mean is this. A soldier, when he wants to look like a soldier, what does he do? He puts off the kind of garment that identifies him with civilians. Then he puts on a kind of uniform that identifies him, points him out as a soldier. How about a football player? You know what he does? When he wants to show that he's a football player or any other athlete, they put off the clothes they were wearing before. Now they put on another kind of clothes that points out their profession or what they do, their hobby perhaps. The policeman, the same thing. Security guard, the same thing. A nurse, a doctor, will wear a certain kind of uniform to suit the profession that he belongs to. And the world is just like that. The world is a uniformed society. What I mean is that many, many people in the world, they dress according to their role in life. A banker will dress according to his role in life. Midwife, nurse, doctor, different kinds of people we can call your attention to. And you can tell a lot about people by the kind of clothes they wear on a daily basis. In a spiritual sense, this is what the Word of God is telling us in our passage today. Telling us that we need to be spiritually dressed to match our identity. And the passage is not talking about the kind of shirt you put on or the kind of sticker that a Christian man or a Christian woman will paste on the chest. It is talking about the spiritual garb, the spiritual garment we wear, or the style of life that befits our Christian identity, our Christian testimony. That's why we're looking at the subject of the topic today, spiritual apparel for the new man. What the new man will put off, what the new man will put on, that will now identify him to be the new creature with a new nature, with a new lifestyle, spiritual apparel for the new man. We'll be looking at three things that naturally come out of the passage. Number one, putting off the old man with his deeds. Number two, the characteristics of the new man. Number three, fellowship and partnership in unity. Let's look at point one, putting off the old man and his deeds. Let's go through again verses 8 and 9. And notice very carefully. But now ye also put off all these. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, evil communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another. Seeing ye have put off the old man and his deeds. Paul the Apostle had been talking to a group of people, and he referred to this group of people in various ways, from the opening verses of the epistle itself, that's Colossians chapter 1. Looking at it from verse 2, he identifies the people that he was writing to. He said, to the saints and the faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae. He said, to the saints, and to the faithful brethren in Christ, that is to those who have been touched by the Lord, converted by the Lord, changed and transformed by the Lord, who are no more sinners, but saints. Now he tells us, because of that identity, because of that name by which we are called, put off all these. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, evil communication out of your mouth. It says, we are brethren. We are no more worldly-minded people, but we have been born again, and we have become brothers and sisters through the cleansing of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now then, if you are brethren, and you are, then it says, what are you going to do? To show your citizenship is in heaven, and that you are related unto Jesus Christ, our elder brother, so to say. And that you are children of the living God, children of a heavenly family. What do you do now to match that profession and that calling? Put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, 
and filthy communication put them up out of your mouth. Then it says in chapter 1 verse 4, Since we heard of your faith in Christ, and of your love which we have to all the saints, we've been hearing about you, good things about you. We hear that your life has changed. We hear that you place your faith in Christ. Now to match that profession. You know, a doctor will dress to match his profession. A nurse will dress to match her profession. A soldier will dress to match the profession that he belongs to. Now we've been hearing about you. That you now profess Christ. This profession of faith will need a kind of spiritual garb, spiritual dressing that will match it. And before you dress according to your new nature, put off all this. You'll need to put off anger. You know what it is? Anger. That when you are your old self, old life, you could get angry and be trembling under the feet of anger. Or you could get angry and be screaming and be shouting and really manifest that pout of anger. But now, you are a child of God. You placed your faith in Christ, a follower, disciple of Jesus Christ. Well, live to match that profession. And you will need to put off anger. Wrath. You'll need to put off malice. You know the kind of settled wrath and bitterness that will say, I have nothing to do with so and so. You see, Jesus Christ has everything to do with every creature. He died for every creature. And he says, go ye to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Because you have been sent to every creature, you cannot keep malice with any creature. Because Christ, our own Lord, our Savior, he died to give his blood to, for the salvation of every creature. You just cannot keep money with any creature. And because he has sent us with an errand, errand of love, to preach the gospel and to show the love of God unto every creature, you cannot keep money with any creature. And blaspheme out of your mouth. Think about it. It says, now you believe in Christ. You place your faith in Christ. How can somebody who lives in Christ blaspheme at the same time in Congress? Cannot be proper. That if you are now a child of God, we have heard of your faith. We have heard of your faith, your faith in Christ Jesus and your love to all the saints. Well then, you'll have to put off from your mouth every filthy, con com uh, every filthy conversation out of your mouth as well as blasphemy. Now it says then, that you ought to live according to your profession. Actually, it's been developing this theme from Colossians chapter 1. Look at verse 10. Colossians chapter 1, verse 10. That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Here he tells us that now we are children of God. What are we going to do then? We're going to walk worthy. And if you are going to walk worthy, another spiritual way of saying that is that you put on some things, you put on some new things. And in chapter 2 verse 6, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Now you can understand that Paul the Apostle, developing this theme, he was telling the people, now you are new creatures. You should put on the new man. And you should shed off, put off all the characteristics of the old life. Let's go back to chapter 3. From verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ seated on the right hand of God. You see, he tells us that he looks at us in various ways. And he lo as he looks at us, he sees that everything ought to have become new. Everything ought to have become new. And therefore he says, now we're going to have to spiritually dress to match our new status, our new profession, our new calling, our new stage of life. Then he says, put up all these. And if we look at the words one by one, I've been talking about ye. In, verse, in um, Colossians chapter 3, verse 8. But now, put Ye also put off. Ye. I've been talking about the people he referred to. And I've been talking about those people as the children of God. The people that are saints. The people that are faithful brethren in Christ. 
and the people that have the grace of God and the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ in their hearts, and the people that ought to walk worthy, the people that have received Christ, the people who have risen with Christ, and therefore they need to seek those things which are above. Those are the people. And if you are born again, aren't you one of them? If you are a child of God, are you not the one being addressed in this passage? Now ye also put off all these. Let's look at the word all. Put off all these. Not just some of them. Not just some of them. You see, there are some believers that will say, I'm making progress. I've put off some of my sins. I've put off some of my old habits. I've put off some of the things I used to do that were not pleasing to God. A fraction remains, but I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting a more put up every time. But no, put up all these. You see, we cannot say, well, you know, anger is my peculiar problem. I have done well in all the other areas. I have put up all other things. Do you know that's what some so-called Christians, that's what they say? They would say, well, they cannot put up every evil thing, but they are better than what they used to be. And they are better than what they were in the world. And when you see them get angry and you challenge them, you say, but you are a new creature. But you say you are born again. Oh, they will say, that's the only thing that remains. All the other things you could have pointed to in my life, everything has gone except this. Well, you have not really done what the Lord wants you to do. Put up all these. Anger. Anger. You see some people, whenever some things displease them, the immediate reaction is anger. Put it up. Some people, immediately they do not have agreement with something. Something in the church, something in the family, something the wife has done, something the husband has said. The immediate reaction is anger. Put it up. You see some people in their offices, when co-workers, when colleagues, or when the superior, or when the subordinate does something, or says something, or acts in a particular way that is not pleasing to them, or that insults them, injures them, immediate reaction is anger. Put it off. It may be that the children, sometimes children are children. Children are children. I'm surprised for some believers that don't understand that children are children. Even if your children are born again. Even if your children read the Bible, even if your children love the Lord, even if your children pray often, children are children. And there are things children will do that adults will feel that that thing is not good enough. It's not appropriate enough. But you know, some Christian parents, whenever their children do something that children do, that children do normally, the immediate reaction is anger. My brother, put it off. Sister, put it off. Put off all these wrath, wrath. You know, some people really have heat within. I'm talking of bitterness within. Some people, even though they are living with members of the family, they have this settled bitterness and wrath against, maybe against the wife, because of something, maybe a big thing, maybe a small thing, whatever. Whatever had happened, this wrath is there. You see it on their faces. It almost gives them even high blood pressure. It gives them almost heart attack because of the wrath, settled wrath. Or maybe somebody, you know, sometimes some of us who are preachers, uh, if we're not careful, we could allow something like this. Many, many things will happen in the church every time. You know why? The church has tires as well as wheat. Not only that, you know, the church has those who are matured and those who are immature. And sometimes, you know, the immature people are even more in number than the matured people. And even some people that we feel ought to be matured, sometimes, not always, but sometimes they behave like babies. They behave like, they behave like children. If you are not careful as a leader in the church, if I am not careful as a leader in the church, when I hear that this happened through so-and-so, this happened, so-and-so did this, you know, if I am not careful, if you are not careful, we're going to have wrath. We're going to have bitterness. And God says that will not be right. That will not be right. It will not show that we're the new man that we ought to be. Therefore, put it off. Anger, wrath, malice. 
And you know, sometimes uh, we ought to know. In fact, leadership exposes us to many, many people, many, many things. Think about me, for example, as a pastor. So I don't use other people as an example this time. Now, I hear many things about many people. And if one is not careful, one will just say, oh, that fellow is so bad. That fellow is so bad. We have nothing to do with that fellow again. And the church has nothing to do with that fellow again. We just don't need him anymore. We don't need her anymore. You know, that will not be a Christian attitude. And we in leadership ought to be very careful that we put up malice. What should ever happen? Tell me what should happen ever that will make a leader, that will make a pastor say, I'm not going to talk to so-and-so. I don't want to see so-and-so's face. Should never, never, never happen. Put it off. Or blasphemy. Of course, we never should blaspheme. I'm sure you know that. And feel the communication out of your mouth. You know, we Christians, we don't have filthy jokes, dirty jokes with one another or with unbelievers. We frown at it. If people have, if they cast dirty jokes around us, we show that we have put that off long ago when we became born again. Between husband and wife, no filthy jokes. No filthy jokes. It should be something clean, something proper, something that brings joy. Something that will just bring a smile uh, on the face of the husband, on the face of the wife. Nothing filthy, nothing dirty. And between us and a fellow brother, two brothers are discussing together. Can we talk in such a pleasant manner that each of us could laugh or smile at one another? Well, that's all right. But then it should not be something filthy. We Christians should not enjoy dirty jokes, filthy jokes. And then it says in verse 9, Lie not one to another. You know, Christian people should be the most trustworthy, the most dependable. Why? Because we have put up the old man with his deeds. It's the old man that is cunning, that is uh, wickedly clever. It is the old man that will know how to cheat the other fellow, how to defraud the other fellow. It is the old man, I mean the old nature, I mean the sinful nature, I mean the Adamic nature, that will be able to, that will know how to go beyond and then make a person to fall or make a person to do something foolish. We shouldn't do that. And we should not lie one to another. Seen ye have put off the old man with his deed. You see, we have this to do. Immediately you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, you begin to examine your life. And you see the things that have brought foolishness in your life before, wickedness in your life before, sinfulness in your life before, you just put them off. You see that one, those uh, bad records, those ones must go. Those uh, cassettes of songs, of worldly songs, that will make your mind to be thinking about the pollutions of the world, that thing must go. And those dressings of the world, that's why we put them off. We put them off. That lady will look at that uh, dress that has uh, been exposing her body in an improper way to the people of the public. And the lady will say, now I'm a new creature. I've been born again. That one must go. And not only that, all the pornographic literature that you've been having before you say, that one must go. The same thing with the character or the characteristics of the old man that had been in your life before you came to the Lord. You say, that one must go. That one must go. That is the lifestyle of the real believer. Let's look at Romans chapter 6. Verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. The reason we are to put off all this is so that sin will not be in our lives anymore. Evil will not be in our lives anymore. That ye henceforth should not serve sin. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. A very wonderful passage. Reading from verse 22. That ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful laws. Stop here for a moment. Paul the apostle writing to the Colossians said, put off all these things. Writing to the Romans, he said, you know, our old man has been crucified and, has been, and should be destroyed so that it will be buried and we should not serve sin. And then writing to the Ephesians, he said, Ephesians, the same message, 
put up concerning the former conversation, the old man. You know what I learned there? If you are a Christian, or let me put it this way first. If you had been a Christian at that time, and you were at Rome, the same message you would have heard, whether you were at Rome, or at Colossae, or at Ephesus. Now, bring it to us today. If you are a real Christian, if you are a real Bible Christian, the same message you ought to be hearing, whether you are in this city, or you are in another city, the same message you should be hearing, put up concerning the former conversation, the old man. Put up all these things. The old man is crucified that the body of sin might be destroyed. Put it another way. And this one is what we need to consider seriously. That actually in the sight of God, actually in the mind of the Lord, it shouldn't have mattered which denomination you were. In deeper life, in another church, another denomination, the normal intention of God is that you will hear the same thing. You will hear the same thing. There will be no contradiction. You look at it. That Paul, the apostle. Or Peter, the apostle. Or John, the apostle. Even though they ministered at different times in different places. The same word. They never contradicted one another. You know, if we were really in the center of the will of God, every church should be a Bible church. There's no other kind of church. There's no other kind of church. Every church should be a Bible church, whether deeper life or any other kind of denomination. And it's a pity at the moment that we don't hear the same thing in all denominations. But if all of us were in the will of God and in the center of the will of God, we should be hearing the same thing everywhere. Look at what we're reading in Ephesians again. We have read it in Colossians. We have read something similar in Romans. And you'll see it all over the Bible. And it shows us that it should be the same message. The same message of purity. The same message of Christ-likeness. The same message of holiness we should be hearing everywhere. Verse 22 again. That she put up concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful laws, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That ye put on, you see that the same thing, and ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, look at this again, wherefore, putting away lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Now it's telling us the same thing. It's saying, verse 26, be ye angry and sin not. Ah, you said, that one is different from Colossians, because Colossians said, Put away anger. No, it's not different. I will explain it to you. Look at verse 31 before I explain it to you. Verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. You see they are the same now. You see they are the same now. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you. With all malice. So, my brother Osman, you cannot uh, hide behind verse 26 and say, Aha, uh -huh, I can be angry at my wife. And my sister, a uh, wife, you cannot uh, hide behind verse 26 and say, Aha, uh -huh, I can be angry at my husband. No, verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Let's go back to verse 26. Be angry and sin not. Be angry and sin not. What is this saying? Now, this is saying in very simple language, be angry so that you will not sin. Be angry, but make sure that in that anger, you will not sin. Can I give you some illustrations that will help you to understand? Let's say, for example, that you are a manager in a bank and as a manager in the bank you see that the cashier had been putting away some money into his personal account and uh, you see that when the auditors come and they look at the accounts this uh, young man is going to get you into trouble and then as you discovered it you called him and as you called him you said young man tell me it appears that you have been unfaithful in this uh, place you have not been doing actually the right thing. Now what are you doing? You want to discover what he has done. 
Will you be saying that with smiling? Would you be saying that putting your arms around him? Would you be saying that saying, well, this doesn't really matter because uh, you're a young man and it's going to get you a long time before you have a house, a car, and other things. Therefore, I, I can't blame you that you're putting some money away. I just want to know the truth about it. I'm sure you will not address the issue like that. You're going to look serious. You're going to look firm. Your face is going to look grave. And your, your words are going to be very weighty. And you are going to be dead serious about it. You know what you are doing? You are angry in a way. But you are not sinning. You are angry because you hate sin. Let's put it another way. A woman had boyfriend before. But now she is born again. A child of God. Not only that, uh, she has now known the will of God in marriage. And uh, she is uh, preparing to get married to the husband. And as she was going on the way, this old boyfriend that she has put away, now just saw her suddenly, oh, and said, uh, lady so-and-so, how are you? And uh, started to talk as they were talking before. Started to talk as if uh, he wants to make love unto her. Now, what will the woman do? Will the woman smile and say, oh, my good old friend, how are you now? I think it's all right with you. And the man will say, well, things are all right. Can we go to a nearby hotel and mess up? No. Will the woman be smiling? No, not at all. When immediately that old man or that old friend will say, oh, lady so-and-so, oh, she will stand there firm and be look very serious and look very grave. What's that? Angry countenance will drive away the sin, the sinful fellow. That's what the Bible says. And it says, be ye angry and sin not. Or let's say you are at home and your child is getting near the flames of the fire. And you say, boy, so and so, get out of that place and the boy is still there. What are you going to do? Are you going to keep on smiling and say, well, it's a little boy. He doesn't know that the flame will burn him. And you'll keep on smiling and say, well, I've told you, it's now in your hand, but I love you in any case. I will never scold you. I will never spank you. You don't do that. Then you look serious all of a sudden. You say, I said leave that place. That thing is dangerous. And you might even spank that boy a little. Be ye angry and sin not. Then it says, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. It's talking about when you rebuke somebody, you've corrected somebody, you've been firm, you've been very grave and weighty because you are trying to make them overcome sin or, or avoid sin. But you don't allow it to remain in your heart or in your mind. You keep on a normal relationship. Neither give place to the devil. Neither give place to the devil. And then let him that soul still no more. Rather, let him labor walking with his hand the things which is good. The thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and Anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another. Be ye kind one to another. Be ye kind one to another. As tender hearted, forgiving one another. As God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Here is what the Lord is telling us. He's telling us that when you became a Christian, you stopped being the old man. And you became a new man. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, is the new creature. All things are passed away. All things are become new. Now you are the old man and his deeds before conversion. Now that you are converted, you are a new man. The practices which were normal to your old life, to the old man, are now abnormal to you. They do not belong to you anymore. New men in old clothes do not adorn the kingdom of God. If you say you are a new creature, but you are still manifesting old habits, you are not bringing glory to God. New men in old clothes do not adorn the kingdom of God. The new man's style of life must reveal the reality of his new internal life. The moment you believe in Christ, by a divine miracle, the old life dies, and you rise to new life 
and thus you become a new man. Now, you are then to respond to the new life by putting up the old clothes, the old deeds. And the, the, you put on new ones as a new man. Already we have learned that in this Colossians chapter 3, there are things we must throw away once and for all. Once and for all. That is, we throw them away, never to return to them again. And what are those things? Many of them. You look at Colossians chapter 3, and you look at it from verse 5. Multiply therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness which is idolatry, verse 8. But now ye also, together with those things in verse 5, ye also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth, lie not one to another. Seeing ye have put up the old man with his deeds. Every new creature should separate completely from the old habits and the old selfishness that belonged to the old man and take on the new habits of selflessness, Christ-likeness, which belong to the new man. A new life demands a new lifestyle. Let's look at point two. The characteristics of the new man. Characteristics of the new man. What do we learn about the new man? Let's look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 10. And I put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Put on the new man. Put on the new man. Which means that one definite characteristic of the new man is that it is totally different. He is totally different from the old man. Now, as a real believer, you walk differently. You think differently. You behave differently. And you live your life differently, different from what you were doing before. You are no more following after the behavior, after the pattern of life of the Gentiles. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Therefore, if you, are, if you have become a new creature, you are now born again. You know what to do? You should walk according to the newness of life. And you put off all the old life of vanity and shame. In verse 24, and that ye put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. That is, the old is gone. The new has begun. And then in the new, that means that you have righteousness and true holiness. Not a kind of patchwork, not a kind of hypocritical lifestyle, but you become a truly new man and you live true, righteous holy life. The true convert is a brand new creature. New life for the new man. And this new life for the new man, though young and tender in Christ, is truly spiritual. Though new and still growing, it has the identity and the likeness of Christ. The new nature is complete, even in him. Yet it has the capacity to grow. Let me explain to you this way. You see, when a new baby is born, that baby is complete with all its parts. And yet it has capacity to grow. So then, it's the new, it's the new nature. Or our new life in the new creature. God's purpose is to make us conform to Christ. And when we are born again, the newness of life is complete in itself. And yet, just like the baby, and yet it has the capacity to grow. And the fullness of growth is when we fully and completely become like the Lord Jesus Christ. That may sound unbelievable or incomprehensible to some people, yet that astounding statement declares God's desire and plan that ultimately God is at work to make the Christian like Christ. He wants us to be like Christ. He wants us to be like Christ. He wants us to be completely new so that we'll be totally, completely conformed unto Christ. Let's look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. For whom he did for no, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among 
many brethren. That is the purpose of God. The plan of God is that we are conformed to the image of Christ in Psalm 51. Psalm 51, verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. David knew that's the plan of God, the desire of God, the purpose of God to make us new. And therefore we need to put on the new man. Shed of the old, become new. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And be not conformed to this world. That means put off all the things that are similar to worldliness. All the things that are similar to the attitudes and the characteristics and the habits practiced in the world. Be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Perfect will of God. So then, the Lord wants us to be new. The Lord wants you to be new. Whatever our profession, whatever we may be doing or saying, whatever our activities, if this new life is not there, all else will be worthless and valueless in the sight of the Lord. Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6, verse 15. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. In Christ, whatever we do, whatever activities, whatever status, whatever position we may have in the church, all these things are worthless and valueless in the sight of the Lord. What God is looking for is that you have become a new creature. And you are spiritually dressed to match the profession and the testimony of being a new creature. You have or you possess the characteristics of the new man. Now let's go back to Colossians chapter 3 and end up with point 3. Colossians chapter 3. Point 3 we find in verse 11. Where there is neither Jew nor Greek, circumcision nor circumcision, barbarians, Ketan, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Now, this verse is telling us something deep, something great, something I believe very high. You see, at the time that Paul wrote, it was a time when there were so many differences among the various groups of people. Number one, there was a racial difference. Jews and Gentiles had nothing to do together. That is, the Greeks and the Jews. There was a world of difference between them racially. Not only that, number two, there were religious barriers, circumcised or uncircumcised. Circumcision or uncircumcision. Those who were circumcised, they looked at the uncircumcised people as castaway people, as pagans, as Gentiles. And the uncircumcised people too, they looked, that, they looked at the circumcised people that they were different. So there were racial barriers, there were religious barriers, and then there were cultural barriers. Cultural barriers. The barbarians were so different from the Scythians. Their cultures were different. Their traditions, their backgrounds were different. There were cultural barriers. Then there were social differences. Social differences. Some bond, some free. That is, some were slaves, but the others were free men. And here Paul the Apostle was telling them something very, very important here. He's been talking of put off all this and put on the new man. Put off something and uh, put on something new. And he said, all this exhortation of putting off and putting on is for everyone alive. For the Greek and for the Jew. For the barbarian and for the Scythian. For the circumcision and for the uncircumcision. For the bond and for the free. He said, there is no difference because Christ is all. What does he mean Christ is all? Christ is everything to us. Christ is everything to us. Is all Christ is our is our salvation and our savior. Christ is our peace and the giver of peace, the Prince of Peace. 
not only that, Christ is our substitute. He imputes and imparts righteousness unto us. Christ is our sanctifier. Christ is our great physician. Christ is everything to us. Christ is all. Not only that, in all. He said, whether Greek or Jew, if you believe in the Lord, Christ is in all of you. Whether circumcised or uncircumcised, if you believe in Christ, Christ is in all of you. Whether barbarian or Scythian, if you believe in Christ, Christ is in all of you. And whether you are born or free, it doesn't matter if you are born again, if you are a child of God, Christ is in all. It says Christ is all. It's everything to us and is in all. Everything to everyone. Therefore, it says there should be fellowship, partnership in unity. Because, you see, every one of us, we look identical now. When you look at soldiers that are dressed in the same way, because of this dressing, there is a kind of uniformity and a kind of unity. You see, when soldiers have come from different backgrounds, they've come from the east or west or north or south. And then they come into the same barracks to be living together. And then they dress in, they dress in the same way. You don't see their differences anymore. They're united in purpose. Take the doctors. The doctors have gone through their profession and now they are dressed the same way and they have the same concern. They want to treat patients and make them well. And they have this association of doctors considering all the needs of their profession. And as you see them being brought together by that profession, they forget their differences. And it doesn't matter any, anymore. Are you from the south or west? Are you from the east or from the north? Because you are in the same profession, then you are united. It's saying the same thing to the believers here. It said, Christ is in all. And Christ is all for every one of us. Therefore, it doesn't matter now whether Greek or Jew, whether circumcised or not circumcised, a barbarian or a skitten, or a bond a person, a slave, or it is um, a free person, that now we are united. Our new life is not only a matter of putting up the old habits and putting on the spiritual lifestyle, it also brings us into new fellowship, new partnership, new communion with one another and with the Lord. All the old barriers are broken down and they are abolished. There is no place now for racial bigotry and for tribal division, just like I emphasized yesterday. God has made us one new man. No more barriers because all the walls of partition have been broken down. It says, let's all become new. Let's all come anew. And when we come anew, there will be a new kind of unity. There will be a new kind of togetherness, a new kind of fellowship and partnership together. In Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, reading from verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who are sometimes far off are made nice by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, to make in himself of twain one new man. That means even though that you have been either Jew or Greek, or, or you have been Gentile, but now he makes the two, he makes them one. Or whether you have been circumcised or uncircumcised, he makes those two, he makes them one. Or whether you are being separated by some cultural barriers, barbarians or Christians, you are now made one. Or whether it is social barrier, you have been slaves or free men, he makes both one new man, so make him peace. This is what the Lord is telling us. That therefore we should be united. We should be one together. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 17. For we being many, are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. That is, we are partaking of Christ. Because of that, we have the life of Christ within us. Therefore, we should have the same mind. We should go the same direction. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Only let your conversation, your manner of life, be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you, or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, 
that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Let there be unity, let there be fellowship, let there be partnership, so that we will be of one mind and standing fast in one spirit. Let us rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer. Remember what the Lord has been teaching us today. You know what to put off? Put them off. Let there be no anger. Let there be no malice. Let there be no wrong. Let there be no blasphemy. Let there be no evil communication out of your mouth. Let there be no lying. Let there be no fornication. And let there be no covetousness or evil desire or inordinate affection or uncleanness. Let us put all these things away and dress new. And dress new. And talk new. And walk new before the Lord that you will be holy in the sight of the Lord. The grace of God is sufficient for us. He's telling us to do this because he knows we can do it. If he knew we couldn't do it as uh, children of God, he wouldn't have commanded us. He tells us to do it because we can do it. We can do it. Put off all those things and put on the new man.